the 34th California state treasurer, the first ever woman of color state treasurer, past state assembly member, past San Francisco Board of Supervisor and Board of Equalization member, delegate to the White House Conference on Small Businesses under President Bill Clinton, chairperson of California Franchising Tax Board and the first ever Asian American woman to serve as California State Assembly Speaker Pro Tempore. Fiona May is right here with us on Yo India TV. Welcome, welcome uh, with uh, me, Jesseline Manuja. And how's the feel at APEC? Well, uh, we're just starting, so I think the excitement is starting to build. I think we're like the one of the first uh, non-official but business uh, receptions and when you come in the door we have uh, men and women dressed in ethnic costumes so that all the delegates feel welcome here. Yeah, I did see um, the Miss American, Miss Asian uh, Queen is also here, you know, so Miss a lot Asian of global. Miss Asian Global. She's Miss Asian Global, yes. It was beautiful to meet her. So, you know, in APEC this year, uh, the overarching theme, as we hear, is creating a resilient and sustainable future for all. So what does that mean for you? Yes. Um, so California has been a leader on so many levels, whether it is for climate, whether it is for women on corporate boards, minorities on corporate boards, just making sure that there's equity inclusion as well as uh, resilience. And I really believe when... Uh, the young people of today see them represented on corporate boards, um, you know, in, uh, you know, uh, panels, in conferences. That gives them hope for the future. And companies need to address uh, the concerns of our next generation because they are very uh, aware and uh, able to articulate that they want to feel like they belong and that people are listening to them. Our iconic landmarks are known the world over. The Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz, our cable cars, and the famously curvy Lombard Street. We have the first and one of the largest Chinatowns in North America. When you wander the city streets, you can end up in Union Square or North Beach, Fisherman's Wharf, the Castro, Japantown, the Mission District, Ghirardelli Square, the Ferry Building, the Legion of Honor, or the Presidio, a national park site. And our demographics speak to our place as a gateway to the Pacific. 33% of San Franciscans are Asian, and we have a large Hispanic population as well. This year, the United States is serving as the chair economy for APEC, and San Francisco is honored to be the host city. The APEC Leaders Meeting will bring together thought leaders, heads of state, and stakeholders to engage on global challenges. APEC is the most significant event with world leaders in San Francisco in recent history. In fact, the last time there was anything like this was 1945 at a United Nations gathering. This year's meetings will focus on the themes of sustainability, inclusivity, innovation, and resilience all values held dear in San Francisco. And there will be many American leaders who will be here as well. President Joe Biden will be here, as will Vice President Kamala Harris. Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen will host the Finance Minister's meeting. And we'll also have Secretary of State Antony Blinken and United States Trade Representative Catherine Tai in town for the meetings. So as elected president of the Asian Business Association, you started getting involved with business issues that affect women and minorities and had also made 60 policy recommendations, if I'm right, to the Congress to help small businesses grow and prosper in the 21st century. So how were your initial experiences in politics, lobbying San Francisco City Hall and the Sacramento State Capitol versus now, after I guess over a decade of your experience in multiple capacities. Yes, so 20 years ago, I think uh, government looked different. I was only the only Asian on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors out of 11 members and only the second woman. This was 20 years ago. And so a lot has changed. More women and people of color have run for office and have been that voice and 
representative of the community. So I think for California, we are the most diverse state in the nation. We speak the most amount of languages. I think we speak 70 plus languages here that people do feel empowered that it's kind of hard to be the first these days, you know, because there are so many people that are stepping up and are, are embraced uh, by California. Uh, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Miss Ma, if you want to get clients quickly, you should be president of this association. It was called the Asian Business Association. They said, it's a nonprofit. We're not going to pay you. It's not going to be a lot of work. And you should do this. And I was really gullible. I was like, okay, I want to start my practice. I'm going to do it. But it was more than a full-time job. So as I was going out, all these meetings and, and lobbying and, and showing up, um, I noticed that, number one, small business is supposed to be the lifeblood of our economy, yet there weren't a lot of elected officials that were from small business or understood small business. It seemed like they kept passing laws that made it more difficult for small businesses to operate. Uh, there also weren't a lot of women in elected office, and back then, not a lot of Asians either. So you are an active member of Cal CPA and GASEC, Government Accounting Standards Advisory Council. So any latest developments that you would like to highlight for the benefit of CPAs or any changes in accounting standards lately done and their impact? Well, I, I think there's always laws that are, are changing uh, to make it easier for accountants to work cross-border because so many of us represent companies that do business in other states and in other nations and so those uh, type of laws are always changing but taxes uh, I'm a tax accountant and so my parents would say there's two things guaranteed in life death and taxes and so taxes is always very sensitive every state has different tax policies and companies and people decide to locate in a certain state because of tax policies sometimes but here in California uh, we believe that uh, people are willing to pay a little bit more in the sunshine tax or a weather tax <laughs> for being here in California. Yeah, but companies did recently move out to Texas, especially in the COVID era. Yeah, but Texas is kind of hot. And, you know, some of the laws that the politicians' uh, legislature uh, is sponsoring is not really good for foreigners. Foreign nationals to own property, for example. Uh, some of the women's rights um, are, are not as favorable as California. So come to California. I think the voters appreciate that I do have a accounting and finance background. Uh, but because of everything I've been doing, I know where the pots of money are. I know who to call to get things done. I came from the private sector and now in the public sector, so focused on streamlining and, and making things easier for the constituents. And I go around the state. I love to travel. If you follow me on social media, I go everywhere and post everything that's amazing about this state. But while I'm out there, people want to know. I want to come to California. I want to expand. And then I have to relay back. Uh, to the governor, uh, to the people that work for me in terms of trying to find buckets of money, trying to incentivize people, companies to stay here in California and grow here. So you were a co-author of SB 840, a bill that would create a single-payer universal health care system throughout California. Tell us a little more about this bill. Healthcare has been very uh, important to me and my family. Uh, we've had pre-existing conditions. Uh, I've had depression uh, on my mother's side. And so uh, being able to find affordable, accessible health care has always been a major concern. So when uh, President Obama was in office, I was very active in trying to make sure that people with pre-existing conditions cannot get discriminated against to get health insurance or get kicked off of health insurance. That is so important because when you need health insurance the most and they say, oh, you're not eligible or we're kicking you off of a plan. I mean, that can be like life and death yeah. for a person, but also financially for the family. So health care, universal health care, access, affordable to everyone is one of my top priorities. So what exactly does universal health care or single payer mean? Well, Basically, it's a system where everybody would have healthcare coverage. We actually already have a program that does what I'm talking about, Medicare. Medicare gives healthcare coverage to Americans over 65, and you're already paying for that right now. 
Yep, there's a little tax that comes out of your paycheck. You've probably seen it. A universal healthcare system would just expand Medicare to cover everybody. And you wouldn't have to wait until you're 65. You just have health insurance. It'd be a benefit of being an American. So tell us a little more about your work around toxic children's choice, the rubber duck bill. Yes, so that was one of my first bills uh, when I got into the elected assembly in 2006 to ban uh, this chemical called phthalates from baby products. Phthalates makes plastic softer. So like in rubber duckies and in rubber book, uh, you know, those, those chewable books. So can you imagine a young child is sucking on like a toxic lollipop? So I uh, felt that I needed to do this. It was a really tough bill. I almost got, you know, um, uh, they almost killed my bill in every single committee in both houses. And even the governor at the time didn't want to sign it. But thanks to the advocacy and, uh, you know, doing what's right, uh, for the United States because Canada, Mexico, and the European Union had, had already banned this chemical called phthalates. I think my legislators uh, and the governor saw it fit to sign this bill. And so then Senator Dianne Feinstein took it uh, at the federal level and signed it into law. So no products coming into California or the United States now should have this toxic chemical. So really protecting our young babies so that they can grow up as healthy as possible. These are the sounds of children at play. It's music to the ears of parents to hear them and see their children be happy. However, a threat not only to their happiness, but also to their lives looms around them and some of their own toys. The culprit, phthalates, a group of chemical compounds mainly used to add flexibility to plastics. There are such long-term harm uh, related to this chemical phthalates that when kids put their the toys in their mouths for a long period of time, it actually causes hormonal and reproductive defects that don't show up right away but show up later on in life. Assembly member Fiona Ma has authored landmark legislation that would prohibit the manufacture, sale and distribution of toys and child care products that contain the toxic plastic intended for use by children under three years of age. Pediatrician Harvey Karp knows all about the danger posed by phthalates plastics. They can cause damage to the kidneys and the liver of animals. And the concern, of course, is if they can cause damage to the, to the animals, do we want our children being exposed to them? I have to tell you, some of the kids in my practice eat more plastic than they do broccoli every day. Children are exposed to plastic. They suck on it, they chew it, it gets into their system. It's not okay for kids to be eating plastic that's toxic. There are a lot of companies out there who are taking responsibility and already producing phthalate-free products, but everybody should be doing that. Um, and what, what's been happening is the U.S. has become the dumping ground for all the bad products. And so my bill is trying to stop that practice and try to set those standards if the federal government and the president uh, don't want to take that responsibility. Very nice. It was really a well-needed bill, well presented, and I'm glad it became an act. Uh, so you worked on human rights campaign to shut down massage parlors. How do you see its impact in long term, uh, especially in reducing the human trafficking and saving the dignity of girls? Yeah, so human trafficking is a billion dollar global uh, problem and it's like whack-a-mole. As soon as you stop it, it just moves uh, to some other you know, state, region, country. Uh, and so it is something that we need to be very vigilant uh, on. So here in San Francisco, I passed a law that would require any new massage establishments to require a conditional use permit. That means if you are the owner of that establishment, you have to come before the government and give your ID. They need to, you know, you need to come to a public hearing. And so because of that law, uh, no new uh, massage parlors, um, illegitimate massage parlors have opened and we really stopped the human trafficking coming into San Francisco. Since you are an economist and finance expert, 
what would be your suggestion to those risk averse individuals who see that a 5 year fixed deposit in banks in india can give them a much higher yield than some peanuts that they receive from banks in us basically there is no short term or long term fully safe investment plus there is inflation that is in play that eats on the growth of savings and new forms of money multiplication like bitcoins are still not legal well i i i think people number one uh financial literacy has been uh one of my key uh cornerstones especially for young people understanding that number one when you get a credit card that it costs money and that that uh interest rate is very very high and it compounds and if you don't pay it back you could get into trouble so as people get more familiar with uh their uh you know the, the financial tools saving is important uh investing where they can make the most amount of money if they're not comfortable then perhaps they should um you know work with a financial planner so that the financial planner they are licensed um they're fiduciaries so they have an obligation to make sure that they are doing what is best for the customer so if you don't know then please seek help from professionals for yes so actually post covid now um we've taken about 3.7 trillion dollars i know that number has been going up um so i'm the banker all the money comes into my office i also uh, invest the state's short term portfolio as well as the short term investments for about 2300 local government units mm -hmm. and i also sell all the bonds for the state of california the uc and the csu system so that's like the banking side then over the years i don't know if you remember speaker just unru mm -hmm. when he became treasurer he said oh my god We're sitting on so much money we should be doing more. So now I fund and finance affordable housing, public transportation, schools, green energy, garbage and recycling, advanced manufacturing. I oversee four savings programs and that's just within the treasurer's office. So last but not the least, what's your message to all the viewers of Yo India TV and especially those who want to see the state of California out of debt? Yes. Uh well, I think uh number 1, uh we have a very long relationship with India. Um we hope that more people will come and visit us and vice versa. I think we have a lot to learn from each other and a lot that we can uh do to make sure that the world is prospering but also creating peace. around the world. I think all of us that live here, we want a peaceful society for ourselves and the next generation and so just forming those better bonds. Please come and invite us. Woohoo and look forward to a very successful APEC and your beautiful contributions. We truly appreciate your time in speaking with you India TV. Thank you. Thank you so much.